Well, it is a joy to be home. I know home is heaven, and for 40 years the Philippines has been our home, our home base, but home is where the heart is. So we're home. We're home here at Faith. And I would like to share with you something that I believe can help transform our lives, can help transform the church with the title of being Becoming a Mighty Army. Becoming a Mighty Army. We know the Lord Jesus declared to his disciples, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he started with just 12 disciples. Now there are hundreds of millions of dedicated Christians around the world. He is building his church. He is building an army that's going to fulfill his purposes and become victorious over sin and Satan. He gave us our marching orders in Mark 16 and Matthew 28. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of the nations. And we are living in the generation that's going to see the church of Jesus, the army of God, complete our marching orders. We were given marching orders. Go into all the world. And so from faith, I've gone into lots of the world, okay, where I haven't gone. My books have. They're in 20 languages, studied by tens of thousands of pastors around the world. And we're thankful for the privilege we have of having received the Word of God here at, it was Faith Tabernacle back then, then Faith Temple, now Faith Church, that's fine, as long as you're an army of faith. Amen. Amen. And so we want to look at how God is going to complete through us that great commission, how the army of God is going to triumph. You've read the end of the book? You know who wins? Okay, you, you look, look at or you read the modern news media and it's all full of bad news. But we look at this book and it's the glad news. We win, amen, through Christ. We are on the victory side. However, however, there are many times when we don't yet look like the mighty army of God. Many of us have had very difficult years during pandemic. Some have lost their jobs. We know inflation is crazy. Uh, uh, world conflicts, uh, family conflicts, uh, health difficulties. We don't always look like the victorious army of God. That is what God is preparing us for. So we need to learn how does he prepare us? How can we be sure that we are a part of that triumphant army? He's going to have that triumphant army throughout the whole world. The question is, how much will you and I be a part of that victorious church? That's the only question. He's going to do it, but will he do it through you and through me? And so we want to look this morning at a prophetic vision in the Old Testament that God gave the prophet Ezekiel on how God will take his discouraged, defeated people and make us the mighty army of God. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, or maybe we'll have it on the screen, or I'll just read for you from Ezekiel chapter 37. We'll start with the first two verses of this vision that Ezekiel had. The vision of the valley full of dry bones. So from the New Living Translation, it says, The Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Now, if you've ever hoped for a vision from the Lord, you know, you'll hope you see Jesus or you'll be taken to heaven. Uh, how many of you want to have a vision and you're taken to a cemetery? Okay, that doesn't exactly sound like the kind of visions we want. But that's what God did for Ezekiel. Took him to a valley full of dry bones, a huge cemetery. And at the end of the vision, in verse 11 of Ezekiel 37, the Lord explained the vision. And God said, these bones represent the people of God. They are saying, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, and we are cut off. 
That's God's people in the valley of dry bones. And it's true, many times God's people do feel dry, disconnected, no more hope. Maybe we can't break through in our prayers. We just feel like our prayers go nowhere and, and we can't connect with God. There are times that uh, in church people are dissatisfied and uh, decide, well, I'll just, I'll just Zoom in or Facebook in whatever you use on the media. And if that's all you can do, if you're infirm and in at home, God bless you. But if you got two good feet, come to church. Amen. <laughs> and be part, more a part of the victorious army of God. And yet there are so many problems around us in society, in the nation, in the world. And we find that many times God's people are scattered and to dry, like in Ezekiel's valley of dry bones. Now in verse 3, the Lord asked Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live again? In the natural, it looked impossible. There are times in our lives, in our families, that it looks like there are impossible situations that are just not getting fixed. Can these dry bones live? Ezekiel wisely answered, Lord, you know. You know. He certainly didn't. And there are times we don't know what's going on. But whenever we face difficulties, we have to remember we're not at the end of the story. All right? We're not at the end of the story. We're not at the end of that loved one who has strayed. Uh, we're not at the end of their story. We're not at the end of, of people that have been battling sickness or financial difficulty. We're not at the end yet. Lord, you know. And so what was God's answer to Ezekiel? Let's read from verses 4 through 7. The first step towards taking God's defeated people and raising them up as a mighty army of God. So from verse 4 of Ezekiel 37, Then God said to me, Speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. And then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message, just as he told me. Suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then, as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies. But they still had no breath within them. And so this was the beginning of God's answer to take that valley of dry bones and transform them into an army. Step number one is get properly connected. Get properly connected to the body of Christ. God's people need to get together in a new way. When we're disconnected, when we're not giving and receiving the life of God that he wants to have flow among us, we need to get together and be like those dry bones that started rattling and started to join together and then become bodies. Although it said there was not, not yet any breath, any spirit within them. But we need to be those that draw nearer to God, yes. And we need to be those that will draw nearer to each other in the purposes of God. In Ephesians 4.16, we can read, From Christ, the whole body, as it is held together by every joint, grows and builds itself up in love, as every member of the body of Christ does their proper work. We each have something to contribute in God. We might think it's inconsequential, it's small, it's not important, but many times it's the little things in God that God uses in a mighty, mighty way. Once God showed me a vision in heaven of a building that we would call a museum. The title was Hall of Remembrance. And in that Hall of Remembrance, I saw a display that was titled God's Mighty Weapons. And those God's Mighty Weapons, the first one was a dry, dead animal bone. 
Does that have a mighty weapon? Are you going to, as a you know, Rochester SWAT team, break in through the doors with, a, with an animal bone, you know, to, to beat back all the uh, forces of evil? No. But that was Samson's jawbone that he used and took by the anointing to kill a thousand of the enemy. Then I saw, I saw a little wooden stake. A little piece of wood. You know, can you see the Marines storming a beachhead with stakes of wood for the attack? Is that a mighty army, uh, a mighty weapon of an army of people? No. It's one of the mighty weapons of God. It was in the book of Judges where a woman named Jael, who lived in a tent, she knew how to pound tent pegs in the ground. She took a tent peg and put it on the head of an enemy king that was asleep and had a mighty Victory, God's mighty weapon, was just a wood, extra wood peg she had hanging around the tent. And there were many other things that would look inconsequential to man, but God makes into mighty weapons. And so we might think, well, what do I have to offer? In God's hand, you have so much to offer. We need to be the army of God that rises up and by his anointing, we can see great things accomplished in your life, in your church, in Rochester, and around the world. God can do great, mighty things. And so we need to learn how to get connected up in the body of Christ and join together and contribute what each one has to offer. When there's been conflict and separations, we need to learn how to release forgiveness because forgiveness is the worst enemy towards God's people being joined together, heart and soul. It's part of the Lord's prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And so we need to be quick to, to go to people when we feel offended and we feel hurt and distanced. Or, if, or in Matthew chapter 5, God, the Lord said, uh, if your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar, you go and talk to him. It's not that you're offended, it's that you know he's offended at you. Go! That is our reasonable worship before we come to the house of God and worship, get things right in the family of God. And so the Lord wants to build forgiveness and heal our wounds and, 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 and put to rest so many of the things that weaken us. Uh, back 1978, I was the director of an evangelism center in Detroit. And we had 12 uh, college-age uh, young people. We evangelized in so many different ways across the slums and the whole city of Detroit. And there was a time when there was some struggling between some of the, uh, uh, the, the team members. And I pulled them aside and I said, listen, your team member is not your enemy. It's the devil that's your enemy. You're fighting the wrong thing. Yes, and sometimes we fight the wrong things. Yes. And we fight a brother, a sister that maybe is not in harmony with us, maybe did something wrong, but they're still a brother. They're still a sister. Christ died for them. Would we die for them? Christ did. May we live to serve and build. And so we want to learn how to discern the body of Christ so that we can receive and give the life of God. My younger daughter had a learning disability since she was born. By age uh, grade five, she could not spell her name, Esther. And yet we went, when we were traveling around the States 20, 25 years ago, going to places of revival, we went to a revival in Baltimore, and there she, she tarried at the altar after the service, and she said, it's like God took two wires in her head that were never connected and put them together. And she went from constantly struggling to just pass her classes and get D's. D was, was praise the Lord for us back then. After that, it was all A's. Graduated from college, studied for a master's. And right now, she is the assistant missions director of a church of about 3,000 people in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She's not. Uh, she doesn't have a learning disability anymore. And yet it was because we discerned the body of Christ. God was moving and we jumped in the waters. There's the story of my father in Christ. 
when he was a minister in France. There was an elderly pastor that had a recurrent uh, infirmity, a sickness. He just couldn't shake it. And there was an elderly lady in the church that had a real burden for him. Prayed for her pastor all the time. In one service, God anointed her with an anointing to heal the sick pastor. And she felt it. And, and she said, uh, Pastor, could I come? Can we pray for you? Can I come pray for you? And the pastor said, no. Was it out of church order? I wasn't there. I don't know. Did he think, well, she's not one of the ministry of the church? You know, uh, why, you know I'm the leader. Why is, she, you know, I, I'm over her. Why is, she, you know, I don't know what his, his logic was. But he didn't let her. And my father in Christ, watching this, discerning it by the spirit, saw he missed his healing. And he remained in his infirmity for a long, long time after that. We find in the scriptures, in the story that Paul talked about, the receiving communion in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 12, uh, he said, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or are dead for not discerning the Lord's body. And so we want, by God's grace, to be able to find out who, who can pray for us and, and pray us through. Uh, who, who, who has the word of counsel that we need? How can we find a brother or sister that's going to encourage us and help pull us through this difficulty? We need to discern the Lord's body. And we need to give. We need to see what can we do? What can we give that's going to make a difference? I remember once leading a pastor's seminar, and at the end of the seminar, I felt to give one of the men uh, there at the seminar my, study, my new study Bible. And he just was shocked and happily took it away. A year later, at the next pastor's seminar, he said, uh, Brother Norman, let me tell you, the year before, when I first met you, he said, I came to the seminar. I was not a pastor. I was a Sunday school teacher. But I, I felt I was called to be a pastor. But I argued with the Lord. Lord, I can't be a pastor. I've never been to Bible school. And he said, the Lord reminded him, well, Jesus never went to, you know, Jeremiah never went, you know, John the Baptist never went. <laughs> and so, so he said, okay, you know. But Lord, I can't be a pastor. I don't even have a study Bible. And at the end of the seminar, that he was complaining to God. He didn't have a study Bible. He had one. And so he said that inspired him to quit his uh, job as a, uh, at the secular high school as a teacher and become a full-time pastor. And one year later, he said, I have 70 members in my church. We've collected all of the building materials debt-free. We're starting to build the church building. We don't know what we can do with even maybe just giving a Bible away when we can learn to be connected in the body of Christ. In 1972, I first came here to Faith Tabernacle, and I could describe myself like, uh, have any of you ever had cats that bring their trophies, drag them in through the door, you know, what they caught, you know, some unfortunate bird or mouse or something. And, you know, have you ever seen that mangled thing that they, their prize they present to you? Well, I was like what the cat dragged in the door of, of Faith Tabernacle. I was a, a rock musician, a druggie, burned out from all of the drugs I had taken, uh, just a mess of a life. And although I gave my heart to Jesus here, I still had so many problems. I was so burned out from the drugs, I couldn't think straight for three seconds. And I, I, I looked at all of the beautiful, uh, uh, healthy, whole people at church, and I went, I'm just not like them. You know, I love Jesus too, but, you know, I'm what the cat dragged in. You know, my hair was like this, and the only... Pants I had had holes all over them, and I see all these fine young men and women. And one of the pastors of the church at that time, his name was Mr. Beale, part of the, of the family that saw revival at Bethesda Missionary Temple back in the 1950s. And he was a very elderly man, and he had a heart condition, 
and he, he, he was too weak to preach anymore, but he was always there at the altar calls to pray with the people that came to the altar. And I was always at the altar call because I always needed a lot more from God. I left so many pools of tears and mucus right about there on the old carpet. You, you had to throw that one away a long time ago, Pastor Steve. Okay? But he loved me so much. He just poured out the love of God. and He never preached. All that he did was he prayed for me. But it made such a difference. And then he passed on to be with the Lord. And I got a message from his family. There were going to be eight pallbearers that would carry his coffin to the gravesite. And he had asked before he died if I would be one of them. Now, if you saw the difference between me and them, you would understand perfectly. Okay? I had hair like this. I was burned out. I, didn't, I had to borrow a suit and what I called a, a, a noose, a tie. Okay? And, uh, and, and I was just a little bit ashamed because the other seven men all had nice now, great three-piece suits, immaculate hair, and, and had, some had gone to Bible school. They obviously were called to the ministry. And Pastor Beale was saying, as his last statement of faith, as we carried his body to the grave, his last statement of faith was, here are eight men that are going to carry on the work of God that I have laid down. And that act of faith, that, and I don't even know if I was born again yet, when he made that instruction that I was to be one of them that would typify and exemplify what was going to go forth from his life and from here at faith. And so that transformed my life. Just a simple funeral where somebody was not ashamed to have me carrying his body to the grave with all of the fine men and the other one. Okay? <laughs> but the other one had a new hope of faith. You mean, I can become a servant of God? God can heal this mind and let me think straight? Well, occasionally my wife would dispute whether he healed me, you know. But, <laughs> but no, God healed me. God transformed me. And I am carrying on the legacy of Pastor Beale and of Faith Church because we have been joined together by the Spirit. God did something eternal in my life there at the altar with Pastor Beal praying for me, with all the pastors, with Sister Edlin praying for me, with all the, the ministry that was pouring the love of God into a soul that in the natural had no hope, had no future. We need to discern the body of Christ. And each one of us has something that we can give. And so as we have a new love and unity in the family of God, in our own families, as we learn to reach out and see redeeming love again and again, heal and strengthen and bring life, God is preparing that the dry bones will become an army. So that was the first step. Ezekiel was to prophesy that the dry bones, the body was to come together again. And then the second step towards that valley of a cemetery being transformed into an army started in verse 7, I think it was, where the Lord told Ezekiel, prophesy to the wind. Wind, come from the four corners and breathe upon these people. And as he prophesied, they rose up in life and became a mighty army. Now, breath in both the Hebrew, Ruach, and in the Greek, Pneuma, means breath. It also means life. It also means spirit. So when Ezekiel was to prophesy to the breath, it was to the spirit, it was to the life, and to cause life the Spirit, the anointing of God to come into those uh, uh, bodies now, put together, but needing life, needing the wind of God's Spirit to become a mighty army of God. And so the Lord wants us for step number two, 
that we pray, that we pray through, and that we see the wind of God, the power of God's Spirit blow upon us again and to do a work of restoration, a work of resurrection within each of our lives. So we need to get to that second step of praying until the power of God falls. And so we see that in uh, different times in history. We see it in the upper room after the discouraged disciples saw that Jesus is alive. And he told them, Terry, wait in Jerusalem till you receive power from on high. And on the day of Pentecost, when they were in one accord, when they had been praying for days after days, then on the day of Pentecost, a mighty rushing wind came from heaven and fire fell upon those early disciples. And 3,000 souls were saved on that first birthday of the power of God filling the people of God, the Pentecostal power of the early church that is to carry on down through the generations. Well, there's the story of how new unity and revival, uh, new unity and prayer brought revival back in a small group of Christians in 1726. In Germany, there was a nobleman named Zinzendorf who invited some wandering Christians to come live on his estate. And so a few hundred persecuted Christians that had been hounded through the nations by those of other religion and those of other persuasion, yet they found refuge in his estate. And it, you would think that all these Christian refugees would be so thankful for his hospitality, but they argued among themselves. They argued about doctrine. They, they wanted this in the group. They wanted that. And, and they were full of division and, and discord. And some of them started to call Count Zinzendorf the Antichrist, their benefactor that gave them a place to live. And so, although he was only 22 years old, Count Zinzendorf was able to get them to focus in that they are the people of God. They're not to fight each other. They're not there to squabble. They're there to unite as the family of God. And being united, see what God will do with them. And so they did unite. They had all-night prayer meetings. They forgave one another. And on August 13th, 1727, they had what they called their Day of Pentecost. And when this revival came to this group of only several hundred Christians, when revival came, they started a prayer meeting that continued on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year, and that Revival prayer meeting continued on for over 100 years from when the power of God first fell on them. And in that 100 years, one out of every 12 of the, 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 the family there, of the, that group of Moravians, they called themselves, one out of 12 went on the mission field far away. They just took one-way tickets. They didn't have enough money. They never expected to go back and see their loved ones again. They weren't professional pastors, very few of them. A couple of the first ones were, were ditch diggers. Some of the others were carpenters, a, a potter, uh, just ordinary workers with the fire of God burning within them. And they went to the nations and saw millions of people saved. And one person they helped lead to the Lord at one of their meetings, his name was John Wesley. And from John Wesley came the over 100 million Methodists around the world today. They saw from that little group, that little band that banded together in prayer and missions, they saw mighty works of God spread through many areas of the world. Well, there's another story of when churches united. That was back in 1830 here in Rochester, New York. They had invited a guest evangelist to come. You probably know his name, Charles Finney. Charles Finney was invited, but he brought a prayer team with him. Reverend Nash and a number of other prayer warriors that didn't even attend the services. They were too busy praying all through the times of the services. Every day they were praying and groaning and travailing and weeping and, and praying revival power to Rochester, New York. 
The churches all got together to have an ecumenical church gathering when this evangelist came. And the power of God was so great that something like almost 50% of the lawyers and doctors in Rochester got saved. Uh, multitudes got saved. So many, they had to build a, a, a seminary down in Lima, New York, now Elam Bible Institute. They had to build a seminary to, to train all of the new pastors. That's where I was trained, at the school that was built to train the converts from the great revival here in Rochester. The shopkeepers one day all gathered together and brought all of their barrels of whiskey and ale and alcoholic drinks to the Genesee River. And they all poured them in. And they said the Genesee River turned brown from all of the barrels of alcohol they dumped in the Genesee. There was revival here in Rochester when the churches gathered together when they prayed. And that's what God wants to do again. You have a calling much greater than just to your own life. Much greater than just to your own family. Those are important, yes. But you have a greater calling. You have a calling at Faith Church for something that will, will impact and help build revival to Rochester. Now, 50 years ago, there was a group of analysts that went through the cities of America and they had different ways that they tested what the different cities were like, their characters. And uh, if someone needed to change uh, a $10 bill would, would, and just ask the stranger, would the stranger be kind and polite or just say, you know, no time? And Rochester, no, they, they, they were so gracious and kind. And people gave twice as much to charity here in Rochester as the average around the country. And when they totaled up all of the statistics... They gave Rochester, New York, 50 years ago, the, the title, America's Kindest City. America's Kindest City. Now, I don't know if, if it's lingered this long. I don't know if it would get the title today. <laughs> but back then, they said, okay, Amer Rochester is different. And then they said, why is it different? And so there was a Reader's Digest article, if any of you ever used to read that, ancient magazine. I don't know if it's still in print even. Okay. We're getting old. Okay. But it was popular to read. And they analyzed why was, America, why was Rochester America's kindest city? They traced it back to the revival that Charles Finney held and how transformed the, not only the individuals, but the character of the city was. Rochester became America's kindest city. May it regain that title again. May the army of God arise again and see not just transformation in individuals, but in the city, a testimony that can reach even to the world as that Reader's Digest testimony. I first read it over in the Philippines. And in the Philippines, I heard that Rochester, New York had that title many years ago. God wants to do it again. I remember in 1996, when Zion Ministries, our ministry was young, our Bible school was, first one was only three years old, and I had another missionary working with me. But he wasn't happy with being my helper, although that's how it was established. He ended up deciding that he should be the director. And, you know, that makes it a little hard to work with somebody that, you know, wants to run the show, and he wasn't appointed to run the show. So after a few months of real uh, disunity and difficulty, he decided to go for greener pastures and left. And then we had a new unity here in the Philippines in our staff. And we prayed. And the third week of Bible school that year, we were sitting in the classroom one night when I saw the wind of God blow in from an area of the, of the building that had no windows, no doors, but I saw a wind blow in and it started to hit the students first on the right side. They were knocked out of their seats, knocked out of their seats. And one man sitting in his seat saw it coming. He held onto his seat tight, boom. And when he was knocked over, he took his chair with him. Okay. And everybody that hadn't been baptized in the spirit fell on the floor speaking in tongues for the next hour or two. And Pentecost came to that little Bible school in Antipolo at the outskirts of Manila. But from that time, we have seen the Spirit of God 
at MOVE. And we're not a little Bible school anymore. We have extension schools. We've trained thousands of Christian leaders and pastors around Asia. We've had Bible schools in six or seven nations. We've got churches in eight nations, dozens of, of churches directly looking to us for leadership, and hundreds of other pastors that would call us a mom and dad in the spirit. And we are seeing the army of God arising in the Philippines and in Asia. From what was uh, beginnings of disunity, uh, small beginnings, it looked like, you know, there might be no hope, nothing, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth kind of thing. And yet, if God can join us together and we keep praying until the wind of God blows. Ah, that makes all the difference. Because at that point, when breath came into them, it said in Ezekiel 37, I think verse 10, and they rose up and stood up a mighty army. No longer a cemetery. They had become an army. And that's what we want to see. That's the end result of what God wants to accomplish in our lives. Now, let me just show a short video of uh, a few of the churches in the Manila area that are under our, uh, under our covering that say that my wife and I are their uh, spiritual mom and dad. Let's just see a little video of that. And how God Today we have had a glimpse of what we can read in Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the dew of Mount Hermon falling upon Zion's mountains. For there the Lord commanded his blessing, life forevermore. We are thankful that God commands his blessing upon his people when we are together, when we are of one heart, when we are one family. And we thank the Lord for the family of God that he is building among us. And so that's part of the family of God that by God's grace we are building in the Manila area and we're building through the Philippines, we're building through many Asian nations where we have Bible schools, where we conduct seminars, where, uh, and the books I've written have been translated into over 20 languages around the world. God's army is rising up to march. And where did that little section of the army of God start? It started with a burned out hippie praying here at the altar at Faith Tabernacle. And God is able to do great things with all of our lives when we really cry out to God, when we really get serious to press in and meet with God. And so from Ezekiel's cemetery, vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, and to seeing them arise as a mighty army, we see very simple steps. First, they needed renewed unity. The bones had to come together. The body of Christ has to unite. New unity plus new prayer, praying for the wind of God, for the power of God to breathe upon that discouraged, defeated people of God. New unity, number one. New prayer, number three. Brings number three, a new army. Yes. That the people of God arise as an army. So can we all say that number one? New unity brings number two, new prayer, which brings number three, a new army. Got that? Say to your neighbor, number one, a new unity will bring two, new prayer, which will bring number three, a new army. Have we got that? Now let's say it to the heavens. Number one, a new unity. Well, two, bring a new prayer. And that will bring three, a new army of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That is how God has worked again and again through the church. And that's how God wants to work again at Faith Church. And today, if you feel a need for new unity, then pray about who you need to talk to. Okay? Give forgiveness, receive forgiveness, build together, help them, encourage them, give them life, receive life. And number two, let's ask God to help us to newly become a real people of prayer. 
pray until revival comes. And when it comes, don't stop praying. Pray, it'll be exported around the world from Faith Church. Amen? Amen. And this morning, if you would like to have a fresh commitment to the Lord, if you want to pray afresh, then Pastor Steve said, I could invite whoever wants to come to the altar to pray. If you feel to leave, God bless you, no problem. But if you've got time and you feel a stirring in your heart to come to the altar, this is a place where the army of God can be formed, where God can put iron into your soul, where God can be bringing new strength and life into the people of God. We want to see each of you victorious in Christ, not a survivor, but a thriver. Not a victim of the devil, but a victor over the devil. Amen? And through prayer, we can see the army of God arise. So if you'd like to come for prayer, my wife and I would love to pray with you. I know God transformed my life right here at the altar at Faith Tabernacle, or then Temple here, back 50 years ago. And I know he can transform you also. God bless you. Thank you. so much for watching this video. We pray that it encouraged and blessed you. We invite you to check out more of our content. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'll see you soon.